We've got a couple of phenomenal cartoonists back in California who are joining us, uh, Lalo Alcaraz and uh, Angelo, Angelo Lopez, Lopez. Uh, right here with okay. me in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at the, in All Souls, is David G. Brown, another award-winning cartoonist. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, and it's certainly been a pleasure being here, and I had the best host. You know, I saw a lot of incredible landmarks, and it's been quite an inspiration being here. Thank you. Yeah, we, we took David around to see a lot of the sites of Greenwood, and he's just been so interested and intrigued. And he's talking about writing an article uh, about this when he gets back. He works for the L.A. Sentinel as their staff cartoonist. He's been doing that for how many years? Well, it's been almost about 18 years. 18 years. He's a prolific cartoonist. Uh, so, I want to say this before. We're going to show you a quick intro video of the book, but I want to say this to everybody who's watching and everybody who's here with us is that this, is, this night is about political cartooning, editorial cartooning, which by nature is political. Right. So tonight we're not censoring anybody. All these cartoonists have their own perspective, their own politics, and we're here to hear from them and find out what they think. So this is a disclaimer that this nobody is speaking on behalf of all souls or this church community. These are each individual cartoonist speaking from their own perspective. And so we're we're leaning into that part of our tradition, which values freedom of speech and freedom of individual thought. And that's what we're going to see tonight. So with that, I'd ask if we could roll this short introductory video and uh, check this out. This, this is pretty cool that you put this Thank together. You. <laughs> Greetings. David G. Brown, award-winning cartoonist, educator, and publisher, wants to share his latest project launcher. Pandemic, race and the media, hashtag diabolical 2020 sucked. This book is a collection of political cartoons inspired by 2020, the worst year in my lifetime and probably yours. We had a racist liar for a president who tried destroying anything good about the United States of America, who made irresponsible statements that encouraged mistrust and divisions among Americans. And oh yeah, there was the pandemic that our government told us it would go away by summer. To date, there has been over 500,000 deaths in the United States of America. Last year had a profound impact on America and the world. Pandemic, race, and the media, hashtag diabolical 2020 sucked, features a retro sci-fi cover by the talented illustrator Lawrence Fletcher. Inside, the work of celebrated political cartoons by David G. Brown, Latino syndicated cartoonist Lalo Alcaraz, K. Chronicles, Inc., and the nightlife cartoonist creator Keith Knight, who inspired the Hulu television series Woke, award-winning editorial cartoonist Steve Greenberg, and Angelo Lopez. Take advantage of this opportunity to be part of this historical book about the worst year of our lifetime, 2020, pandemic, race and the media, hashtag diabolical 2020 sucked. Uh, yeah, I, lo I love that music. Uh, you, you, how'd you choose that music so, so I, for the background? So the music is from the day the earth stood still <laughs> you know a classic science fiction uh, you know uh, movie one of my favorites and the reason why i chose that is because i i felt that 2020 almost felt like a uh like a a sci-fi movie you mm. know uh the scopic future that you've seen oftentimes in sci-fi movies and i remember you know i was a full-time teacher until uh, I remember March 13th when my principal walked into my classroom and said, you're not coming back on Monday. You're going to do it virtually. And so, you know, the whole year 2020 just seemed so unreal. And, um, you know, who, who would think that, you know, Americans are walking around with masks on their faces? <laughs> it seemed right. like something 
from a sci-fi, dystopian sci-fi movie. It sure does. So yeah. uh, tell, say a little bit, I'm going to pull up the, uh, some of your cartoons, okay. but, but as right. I do, talk a little bit about this. I guess this originally was going to be a book of cartoons about Donald Trump, yeah, and it, then it sort of switched yeah, over. I, uh, you know, I wanted to do a book, and I was planning to put together a book. And as I reflected on the cartoons that I was doing, I, I did like maybe 70% of my cartoons were about Donald Trump. So this project actually started out as a anti-Trump, you know, project, you know, until the pandemic showed up. So, um, so that's what it is. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's run through some of your cartoons. And, and let me, let me just, yeah. before we get started, I just want to uh, acknowledge how great Marlon has been in terms of being part of this project. Uh, initially, uh, Marlon, I, I, I did a Kickstarter campaign, and he was kind enough to support my project. Then he shared some of his cartoons. And after reviewing his cartoons, I said, wow, this has been such a great contribution to the book. So I just want to say I really appreciate what you've brought to the to this project. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, what an honor for me. <laughs> you know, I really haven't had many cartoons published before yeah. this, but I've been following David. I've been following all of these cartoonists on Instagram. They all have great Instagram pages. And I, so I've been following them for a long time. And this gave me an opportunity when I saw you were doing the book to say, yeah. hey, would you be interested in any of mine? And I sent him some, and when he told me uh, he was, uh, I thought you said one or two, maybe three, and then as the, the book came out, there were 14 of my cartoons. And then also, you know, I knew about Black Wall Street, and I, I you know, and after I got more and more involved with and the understanding of it, uh, it's just a really important part of history. And so when I got invited to come and visit Tulsa, I, you know, I'm really excited and inspired, you know, being here. Thank you. Thank you. So let's run through some of your cartoons. Okay. You know, most of these cartoons are really self-explanatory. <laughs> so, you know, Donald Trump talks about America first. And what are we first in? Coronavirus deaths. <laughs> uh, wealth inequity. Uh, racism and discrimination in healthcare. And what's interesting is that over the course of the pandemic, you know, the rich have gotten richer and the division between the have and have not has just gotten wider, which I think uh, is just uh, really frustrating and disappointing. Yeah. And of course, the pandemic <laughs> that you know, our government said we go away, what do you say, in the spring that right. it was going to go away? Right. Um, and how it was played down and, you know, and, and actually I think it was used as a political tool too. I mean, even today, you know, it's really disappointing to see that. So this illustrates that. Um, let's talk about, you know, how law enforcement treats um, you know, individuals and, and groups and how Black Lives Matter is portrayed as a, a terrorist group and promoting violence when it's really all about uh, protecting the communities of right. color. Where at the same time, January 6th, it was like uh, they're portraying it as a tour, you know, uh, you know, with, you know, and, and, and the violence and, and our president at the time said that they're very good people. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, the different ways that, that protesters have been treated in this time, and I just love how through a couple of words and a couple of images, you really make that point. And then, you know, I think, you know, one of the saddest parts of this pandemic is how many lives were lost uh, when, it, when it wasn't necessary. And I think part of that has been the misinformation that's been conveyed and the way, you know, our government and leadership approached it. So I, I think that that's one of the really sad things. I've, I've lost, personally have lost, you know, people over the course of the year. And it's, it's the value of life to me, it's just really a, a sad situation. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the, the Jim Crow laws, you know, uh, preventing, you know, people from voting. I mean, is this a strategy to <laughs> by uh, the Republican Party to, you know, to win? 
Uh, and I think that, you know, when you think about the United States and the right to vote is, you know, one of the most valuable things that we have. It's important. It's very important. And this is pretty self-explanatory. I think, you know, um, this was a tipping point and I think a very important trial uh, in terms of how, uh, you know, armed, unarmed African-Americans, uh, you know, over the year, you know, statistically, it's just, um, just sad, oh, yeah. just sad. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that, you know, the verdict was, was right. And when you think about it, if it wasn't videotaped, how different would that verdict right. have been? Right. You know, that's, a, so. that's a great question. And again, uh, just to be going through the pandemic and at the same time, this incredible racial reckoning, people were sitting in their homes. Right. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons that's why true. people were paying attention in a new exactly. way. And, and this exactly. became such exactly. an important issue. And, yeah. uh, and I love how you highlighted that okay. in your... Uh, so the one, one last thing I do want to say is I do think the pandemic really kind of uh, was like an unveiling of some of the issues that we have in America and, you know, just, you know, making them more clear and more evident, mm. you know, mm -hmm. some of the injustice and equities. Right. right. So I do want to take the time to introduce Marlon's cartoons. Um, I think that, you know, he's, you know, just a, just has a wonderful spirit and what he's done, you know, with this church has been great. And his fight for justice, you know, is very important. And I really commend him for that. Um, I got here early in the week and he was kind enough to, to show me around and look at the landmarks. And um, uh, so it's really been special. And I, you know, he's a really special man, you know, on a mission <laughs> and that I'm hopeful that, that we'll be working together in the future. Thank you. I, I love that. Well, I appreciate all your support of my cartooning of and course. my art and uh, just your mentorship it means a lot to me. It's been okay. just a joy to, to take you around, to see Tulsa, to see the historic yeah. uh, Black Wall Street yeah. and all the, the places introduce you to some some yeah. of the some of the people. Now you can see in the picture for those who don't know me, I'm a I'm a I'm a minister by day and a cartoonist <laughs> by night, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I th it really what I used to cartoon when I was a teenager and a young adult. And I stopped for probably 30 years. But with everything that's been happening over the last few years, I just needed some kind of an outlet to to speak about some of the things that that wouldn't be as appropriate to speak from the pulpit necessarily, but pl places where I wanted to to talk, speak my mind, use some humor, and use some of the art that I do. And it's been therapeutic for me, and and I look forward to seeing where it where it takes me in the future. I'll, I'll share a few of the, the so the, three of my cartoons from the pandemic were in the the are in the book. And then there's the, this series of 11 that come from a series of 30 that I did about the 1921 race massacre. I, the Black Wall Street Times, which is a phenomenal uh, online news source that comes out of Tulsa, Nehemiah Frank is the editor and chief. He and I came up with this idea for me to do a cartoon every day for the month of May leading up to the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the massacre, each one being an, an opportunity for education. So each cartoon came out in the Black Wall Street Times with about uh, anywhere from three to five paragraphs telling the history of, of this moment. And we thought it was a pretty effective way to get people who might not read a whole book about what happened in 1921 mm -hmm. to at least look at a cartoon, see an image, and then read a little bit, and through those 30 days to give people a, a decent background in, in what happened. It was a powerful tool. You know, cartoons are powerful, too, and the imagery sticks with you, you know, and it's really powerful. Right, right. So in this this first one that uh, David selected for tonight is this was May 31st, the, the night that the the the. the all hell broke out and, and the massacre began. It started with, if, just if you know the story, Dick Rowland, a shoe shiner who's African American from the Greenwood community, was accused of um, assault in the newspaper, of assaulting a white elevator operator in, here in Tulsa. So the, there was only one place or very few places where an African American in downtown who was working in downtown could use the bathroom. One of them was in the Drexel building, and so he was taking the elevator up 
and down. No one knows exactly what happened, but when the elevator doors opened, there was a little scream from, this is just the way the story's told, from the elevator operator, and who was a white woman. Anyway, to make a long story short, the newspaper on the front page, it's the evening paper, the Tulsa Tribune, had this article, nab a Negro for attacking girl in the elevator. Well, in 1921 America, to, to talk about a black male accosting or assaulting, which assault was a very strong word back then that the newspaper used um, based on very flimsy evidence, um, that is what you know, mobs and lynchings and a lot happened back in those, in those days with accusations like that. So you can imagine on the front page of the newspaper. So in this cartoon, I'm showing this, this young black, maybe a shoe shiner or someone coming back into the community at night, May 31st going, look at this. Oh my God, right? what's gonna happen? Now on the other side of town, there are the white newspaper boys hawking newspapers, nab a Negro, nab a Negro. And uh, you can see at the top, it says the original fake news. Uh, because this, obviously, this story just took the, what, what had happened or what was described as happening and made it sound worse and worse, which, of course, was the beginning of a mob forming outside the jail. Obviously, people thought this, there was going to be a lynching, and members of the black community came to say, we want to make sure Dick Rowland has his day in court. Uh, but this, this, uh, this was May 31st, both sides of town, two different reactions to the newspaper article in the Tulsa Tribune. Now, some of these in the series, I took historic postcards that were made by white Tulsans following the massacre, pictures of the, of the rubble and the remains. Even some of them have pictures of dead bodies or African-Americans being marched through the streets. And so I took some of these photographs, which were used in essence to to tell the story, possibly even brag about what had happened in Tulsa, sent all over the country. Well, uh, one of the things Nehemiah and I talked about were finding a way to augment or, or alter those postcards to, with cartoon on top to try to tell a different story, a different narrative. In this case, Mama, why do they hate us? And, and just bringing the humanity to these postcards, the humanity, but the children that we don't often talk about when we think about the massacre and what happened that night. You can see the words Tulsa Riot 6-1 uh, down there. That's, that was the, uh, orig from the original postcard. Now in this, this cartoon, this is the Tulsa massacre cold case. A hundred years have passed and there's still, nobody has been held responsible for what happened. And so here you can see the images uh, in the police lineup of, you know, you've got the vigilante on the left, a police officer, because there were police involved, deputized citizens as well. You have the KKK, you have clergy who were, who were involved in, in this in various ways. You have uh, airplane pilots, because it was the first time Americans were, uh, it says, were bombed on our own soil, happened in Greenwood. Uh, during this time, and also judges in the justice system, which had to all be working together, conspiring together to allow this uh, to happen. This was one I did after meeting um, Mother Fletcher, who was one of the survivors, 107 years old. And at the time of the 100th anniversary, she, she was speaking to the community and really asking the community to do the right thing. And part of doing the right thing is some form of reparations, both to the remaining three survivors, all are over 100 years old, and to the descendants and the community at large. So she was speaking out in 107 with passion, cogently, uh, and, and powerfully telling her story. She was seven years old when men came into her home and burned it down and looted, and she had to run with her family for her life. She remembers it like it was yesterday. I, I've seen her talking about it with tears in her eyes, remembering what that experience was like. And she was saying to our city, let's do the right thing now. We're in the final chapter of this story with only a few of us left who actually witnessed it. Can we do the right thing as a city? Asking for reparations uh, from the city, which have yet uh, still never come. It's trying to sew the fabric of our community back together. And then this one, I think maybe the last one from my series, but you can see this is about... And this, I think, got some of the most yeah. conversation it's online. It's powerful. I, I have a brother-in-law that 
grew up in Oklahoma and had no idea and wasn't exposed to any of this in, uh, in high school, right? And talk about critical race theory. I mean, how can you, you know, move forward unless you understand our past? Right. It's crucial. Right. So people, it just wasn't talked about. We meet people all the time here in Tulsa. So this, this uh, simple drawing, uh, it made a lot of, it gathered a lot of reaction. So, so now I get to introduce my brother from another mother, <laughs> my friend, colleague, and one of the most talented cartoonists that I know. Uh, he's, he was nominated, he was a finalist for the Pulitzer this year, but that's a whole <laughs> controversy that I'll let him elaborate on right now. He's got several Emmys, he's got, you know, you, you name it, he's a syndicated cartoonist, he's in the LA Times. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Lalo Alcaraz. And Lalo, we're going we're gonna, to uh, advance these cartoons for you, so uh, if you give us a signal or something, or we'll do our best to follow along, okay? okay? So here's Lalo. Can you hear me? I'm having lots of technical difficulties over here. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the end of the year, and even the machines, the mach I think the machines are tired of us that are working from home. So uh, I apologize for any glitches, but hi, uh, thank you for having me. Wow, this is an honor. I totally would have been out there uh, if it wasn't for the pandemic. And uh, well, here we are talking about the pandemic, uh, but I, I, I am gonna land in Tulsa one of these days uh, and, uh, and check. I actually, I'm working right now on a TV show called The Casa Grandes on Nickelodeon and uh, uh, one of our executives uh, is uh, in, in Tulsa, from Tulsa, uh, and uh, I don't want to embarrass him any further in case he's in the audience uh, or whatever, but if, 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 if Neil, if you're there, wave, but anyway, so uh, um, <clears throat> my cartoons are, uh, I cover, uh, you know, obviously the, what's in the new cycle, and, uh, you know, 2020 was such a strange uh, year with the lockdowns and not knowing what what's legal what's not uh, we just had just such a strange time uh, you know uh, and I I love UFOs so uh, I had to draw uh, a whole planet earth you know um, suffering from this global pandemic I mean I, I I'm blue in the face trying to explain to people that pandemic means it's all over the planet, you know, and uh, I, I don't know why I have to, you know, re-explain uh, the, the most basic things to people. But um, so uh, what happened? Did my, my, my bug uh, go all the way through and crash your computer too? <laughs> I can't hear you, uh, but uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. I hope you can all uh, hear me uh, and uh, uh, this one, uh, I actually, it, it was, talk about a strange year, uh, 2020, uh, was so strange that I actually work with Republicans. Uh, and I work with uh, the uh, Lincoln Project for a couple of cartoons. Um, and uh, this one was about uh, how every Trump event seemed to be a super spreader event. Somehow this guy is counterintuitive uh, and uh, was, uh, you know, uh, bent on spreading coronavirus, you know, because uh, I don't know why, uh, such, a, such a macho man. Uh, and so here he is uh, with his constituency, uh, the, uh, the viruses, um, and uh, they're all happy as can be and just spreading everywhere. But. Uh, we can go on. Thank you. Uh, and also, here's Trump uh, with a, an orange stained mask, if you can see that. Uh, and he, of course, he is even, even uh, through the mask, which says uh, not effective against corrupto virus. Uh, this guy was spreading misinformation uh, and uh, doing shady deals uh, and, uh, and really harming, uh, the, harming the country. Uh, when he should have been doing the opposite. Can change to the next one. Um, this is one of my favorites where uh, uh, it, it says, uh, someone dropped the ball. And of course, you know, 
uh, the former president's famous for not for openly saying he's not responsible for anything. Uh, he doesn't uh, take uh, the blame for anything. Uh, and uh, his famous management style, if that's what you want to call it. And here he is dropping a big coronavirus ball um, on the uh, whole United States. Um, this was one where, you know, editorial cartoonists, we, we have to generate so much work that sometimes uh, two issues can collide or we can kind of jam two issues together. And here's one, uh, and, and sometimes it really works well for a compare and contrast. Uh, and it shows the anti-vax, anti-mask protesters uh, uh, demanding that the lockdowns end, uh, ironically, while uh, some of uh, you know, the children, our children, uh, uh, from uh, other countries were locked up, uh, migrants uh, by ICE uh, in cages by Trump, the famous separator of families. Um, and here's a couple of uh, coronaviruses uh, talking, saying, uh, uh, one says, what do you got there? And the other one is whole, it says, uh, well, it's my coronavirus stimulus. And that one's holding up two Trump rally tickets. Again, super spreader uh, events. Uh, that um, just really, you know, exacerbated the whole thing and uh, cost some people their lives. And I'm, 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 I'm thinking of you, Herman Cain, rest in peace. And that's, uh, and now I am Angelo Lopez. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you. So introduce your good friend. Angelo Lopez. Okay, all right. So the next cartoon is Angelo Lopez, and he's a Filipino uh, cartoonist, a very talented young man, and he has a very unique style. And I think it, it, it also brings like a different perspective to the book. Uh, so take the way, Angelo. Oh, okay, thank you very much, Lalo. I, I, I was wondering why I was starting to look better, and so, <laughs> so um, you know, um, I, I do a cartoon uh, cartoons for the Philippine News Today. The Philippine News Today is a uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area uh, community newspaper for Filipino Americans, and so I, I do. Um, cartoons for that and I just want to say I, I want to say I, I'm honored to be in a book with um, David, Marlon, Lalo and the other cartoonists and stuff so thank you for including me to this book collection and so my first um, cartoon is about uh, Philippine nurses um, in the Philippines Philippine nurses have very low pay and so in order to get high to get better pay they often go overseas for work and one of the things is that um, this has actually been um, a good thing for the world because there's a worldwide nursing shortage. And so um, uh, Philippine nurses have had to, um, they, because they're going overseas, they're, fu they're fulfilling, uh, they're um, helping with the nursing shortage. So, um, so often in many countries, Philippine nurses are in the front lines in fighting against COVID. And this cartoon is about Colin Kaepernick. And there's been a lot of talk about how Colin Kaepernick is an athlete activist, but he's, he's in a long line of athlete activists. There have been many um, athlete activists over the years. Um, Bill Walton was uh, heavily involved in activism. Jackie Robinson, uh, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos. Um, you know, Muhammad Ali, Billie Jean King, and uh, I'm a big Boston Celtics fan and stuff. So Bill Russell was a big uh, um, activist in the 60s. Um, he was involved in the civil rights movement and he led uh, a group of at black athletes in supporting Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali was having trouble with the, um, uh, the draft, uh, with, the, with his draft uh, situation. Okay, and this is a cartoon about the, uh, the rise in violence against Asian Americans. There's a long history of that. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the Watsonville riots, the internment of Japanese Americans, 
uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, a person, uh, a Chinese American named Vincent Chin was beaten up because um, some people thought that he was Japanese American. And uh, there was a lot of Japan uh, bias against Japanese Americans, which, um, which um, flowed, you know, which um, affected all Asian Americans. In 9-11, Asian Americans from um, South a East Asian countries who were Muslim or who people mistake were Muslim were also affected by um, violence against Asians. And so right now there's been a 71% um, rise in violence against Asian Americans um, in 2020. And um, I guess uh, there's a group called Stop AAPI Hate. And uh, since the pandemic period, 3,800 instances of, viol of um, hate against Asian Americans have been recorded and it's probably more. Okay, and this is um, another cartoon I, I did about um, how Philippine nurses um, are, um, are um, you know, filling the, 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 um, the nursing shortage, both in America and around the world. Um, you know, Philippine nurses are doing a lot of work to, to help uh, COVID patients, but at, at this time, they've faced um, the, the prejudice against um, immigrants prejudice against um, agents. And also, um, even, even though nurses, uh, Philippine nurses make up 5% of the American nursing population, 25% uh, uh, of the nurses who died of COVID during this period have been Philippine nurses. And it's be because Philippine nurses have, um, have been, um, they work in uh, wings like the intensive care unit and so they're more vulnerable to be to being exposed to COVID. And uh, this is a cartoon about the history of um, of uh, prejudice against various groups. So um, you know, right now it's Asian Americans, and uh, but there's also been um, uh, you know prejudice against Muslims, pre prejudice against uh, refugees you know, the LGBTQ community, the African-American community, uh, the Mexican-American community, um, the Irish, uh, Filipinos in the 20s and 30s had um, um, a period of prejudice against them. And, you know, you, you were talking about in your cartoon, in Marlin, your cartoons, you're um, trying to put a focus on the, uh, the Tulsa massacre of 1921. Various other groups have faced um, similar targeting, I guess. For Filipinos in 1930, there was a Watsonville riot where for a week, um, a white mob targeted Filipino, the Filipino American community in Watsonville, California, because um, they, were, they were dancing with white women and stuff. And I know with the Mexican American community, there was the Zoot Suit uh, riots that happened in 1943 um because of um because I, you know military began tar you know begin harassing um, uh, Mexican Americans wearing zoot suits and stuff so um, and I'm sure with other groups the Irish um, Mormons Catholics there was also there have also been cases where they've been targeted as well Oh, um, and thank you um, I guess the next person to to, to talk is Steve so I think we're gonna we're gonna Switch take back to us. yeah. So uh, Steve's not with us tonight, so you're gonna yeah. go through over some yeah. of his few of his cartoons and tell us a little bit about who he is or your relationship. So with him. Steve uh, Steve Greenberg, he's a very talented, award-winning cartoonist. Is uh, he's out of Ventura and okay. he does work with the LA Times okay. uh, uh, and several other publications. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about his work. Um, he's uh, you know he's made a great contribution to this book. I've been friends with Steve over the years. We've done panels together before and really, really nice guy, really nice guy. And I just wanna take a minute to thank uh, Lalo and Angelo for uh, taking the time to come in and, and share this platform with us. So uh, are we okay now? Okay. Yeah, we're good. So, um, so, 
coronavirus. So, you know, you know, like most cartoons, they're pretty self-explanatory, but I'll just read some of the dialogue. I don't understand how the virus thing has gotten out of hand, you know. Uh, so he depicts our dysfunctional, you know, administration, you know, that uh, led the virus to infecting, you know, so many Americans. And here is another one talking about, you know, our um, frontline health healthcare workers and, you know, the, their responsibility and also, you know, the 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 great job they've been doing in terms of, you know, um, you know, saving lives. Uh, and at the same time, and often in cases where they didn't have protective equipment, you know, and they put their lives on the line to save others and, 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 and not necessarily paid or given the recognition for right. that. Right. And this talks about what, uh, that. about the dangers that we we face you know and the disparity between people of color and you know white america yeah. you yeah. know so and you know this is kind of self-explanatory how like you know the, the pinball effect and you know um our economy and savings and lives and how you know, this pandemic has really changed the dynamics in terms of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. and, and this cartoon reflects that. Yeah, that's great. great. And local police departments, oftentimes mm -hmm. they've gotten uh, militarized, right. you know, and uh, I think that, um, I think that, you know, the training part of it is so crucial because oftentimes they, they you know, as, law enforcement officers they're often trained as warriors mm -hmm. and not not necessarily as uh protecting and serving us mm -hmm. i mean and that's really uh you know the the in essence the the vow that they make is really about protecting and service serving and i i don't think they often uh have that attitude or approach to their jobs mm -hmm. so, so i'm going to move on to keith knight and Keith Knight is a syndicated, very talented cartoonist. Um, he also inspired uh, a, a television series. Uh, it's called Woke. It's on Hulu. And it just, uh, they just finished rap on uh, the second season. Yeah. And uh, I know that, you know, Keith's been around for, for decades, you know, doing his thing and advocating for justice you know through right. through his work yeah so i have a couple of his cartoons um this one you know is kind of self-explanatory uh, all lives matter with restrictions right. Right. <laughs> restrictions apply right. and you know he has a really kind of uh simplistic but powerful way of uh conveying his message mm -hmm. And speaking of the police department, so this cartoon is, uh, what do you see on, in this picture? So this is a police officer application, question number six. Uh, and do you see sons, brothers, fathers, human beings, or do you see target practice? <laughs> wow. So, you know, very powerful, very simple. Uh, you know, Keith is a, a very talented, and um and and great cartoonist wow incredible and one of the so, best out so, there yeah. so we're going to move to um damara clark and she's my mentee she's 11 years old and she's a very talented you know young lady and she's also a very talented athlete and she's a, she's a tennis player and she's gotten tennis awards. And so uh, she's, she's quite inspirational. I met her uh, last year through a mutual friend that said, hey, I know this young cartoonist and you know, she's got a little talent, you know, maybe you can inspire her. And so I've been uh, mentoring her uh, since last summer and I've got her work published in a couple of publications up close. She's included in the book. Um, 
And my goal with her is to have her produce her own book. So we're working on that. Nice. So to come, you know, and I think one of the biggest things for me is for her to be able to see her potential. Right. And at 11 years old, the stuff that she's doing, I can only imagine, you know, what she's going to be able to do in terms of, you know, the industry. Right. Now, let's show a couple of her cartoons. We'll, we'll stop the screen share. And then I'd love to talk about, okay. uh, you know, cartoon has been mostly a white uh, people's thing here in the United yeah, States. Yeah. So, so you, th this is a rare group of cartoonists you pull together. So, I, and true. I think you're mentoring yeah. her okay. is an important story, part of the story. So, so this is kind of self-explanatory in her, her mother works as a, as a nurse. Okay. So, you know, she understands, you know, the challenges for uh, caretakers and people that work, you know, uh, as nurses. And so, uh, they view this is a this is a battle, you know, mm. and so she mm -hmm. depicts this in uh, in this cartoon, right? And here's another one, you know, depicting you know the challenges and uphill battle in terms of fighting this um, this virus, and and even today, even after all we know about what's effective and not effective, uh, it's still a challenge for them, right? You know, in terms right. of that, right? So. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, well, these are great. She's she's obviously really tall. Eleven years old. I can't even imagine drawing like that at eleven. She's she's incredible.